Very good. Um, I'm Tom. I'm, I'm doing okay. I've been handing out my lights, and if someone hasn't got one, let me know. I'll use one to you. Um, so I'm here to talk about fall prevention, about not falling down, because that's bad. Um, not to put too fine a point on it. Um, so first of all, let me tell you that everybody that knows me, they tell me that I'm in love with the sound of my own voice. And I, I have to admit it's true. I just love the thing. So I will stand up here and babble at you until I pass out from lack of oxygen. So I really need your help. I need you to interrupt me so I can breathe and ask me questions, make comments, um, you know, let's share information among all of us. So I really need you to do that. The other thing that folks really need to be warned about me is that I have this philosophy, and that is that if I have, that, 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 that if a person has a bad joke inside them, you gotta let it out. <laughs> Otherwise, it'll stay there, it'll fester, you'll end up ruining somebody's wedding. <laughs> I've learned this the hard way. So, I'm gonna tell a few bad jokes here, and uh, I'm happy to take pity laughter and groan. I'm even pretty good at dodging thrown objects. So, there you go, but you've been warned. You've been warned. Um, okay, so, falls. 10 years ago, when A Matter of Balance started, folks were just starting to realize that falls are a serious health problem. It turns out that falls are the leading cause of accidental death among older Americans, more than twice the next two categories put together. It also turns out that falls are the leading cause of injury-related emergency room admissions for the entire population, all age groups, all people. The only group that's not true for is that teenage driving age group, and for them it's being hit in the head with a thrown object, bad driving, and then falls. I figure they're driving along, someone hits them in the head with the frisbee, they crash the car, they get out, they fall down. <laughs> so, there you are. Falls are an important problem. Something like $86 billion a year is spent treating falls. So this is important. Now a little bit about matter of balance. What it is, it is the standard of care for cognitive fall prevention. That is coming up with plans and ways of thinking about things, changing our attitudes about falls to prevent falls. We do do some very simple, gentle exercises. I'll talk a little more about that later. But mostly what we do is we sit around and we talk to one another and we come up with ways to keep ourselves safe. Almost everyone has fall concerns. And they all tend to be kind of similar, but they also are very individual. So the solution that works for you may not work for her, okay? And the idea of the class is to get together and figure all this out. What we can do with our houses, with our environment, with our shoes, with our assistive devices, all that kind of thing. And that's what a matter of balance is about. It is a four week course twice a week for two hours each. My job is to provide them all the way across the county. I usually offer about 26 courses a year of which 19 actually go. Um, we need a certain minimum, we need like eight people before we can actually hold the class, and so there you are. But I'm happy to go anywhere and hold a course. So if, if you know of some organization or something that could use this, let us know. My email address is up here, um, and our website is pcoa.org. Uh, I'm also happy to come to groups like this and do this. Um, so, you know, if you have a group or something, I'm, I'm happy to go there. Um, okay, so we are a nationwide. We are in 43 states plus the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, 
in the American Virgin Islands. That's where I want them to send me to coach. But they keep telling me it's not in Pima County. <laughs> Someone's drawn that map wrong. That's all there is. Um, okay, I'm from, oh wait, I was talking about a matter of melon. Um, this happens to me a lot. You know, the train's chugging down the track and suddenly I'm in Prescott. I don't know how I got there. So, um, if I get a little off track, I, I may look at you and kind of stare, and if you could give me a hint, I'd really appreciate it. Um, okay, so anyway, we're also an evidence-based program. And what that means is that people did a whole lot of research and are continuing to into why folks, especially older folks, fall down. Um, and then they designed this program that I give. And so it's very effective. We're always updating it and upgrading it so that it, it stays relevant. One of the things that we have noticed both nationwide and locally is that our classes are starting to have a whole lot more people with Parkinson's in them. And so it's become a concern and I'm always trying to learn more. I am by no means an expert in Parkinson's. I have talked to a lot of people, I've been to places, my father-in-law had Parkinson's before he passed, but I'm not even close to an expert. So if you have some information you think I need to know, please let me know. Um, don't be shy about interrupting me, because I'm already starting to feel lack of oxygen. So <laughs> anyway, um, that's a matter of balance. Um, and if you want to take a course, please contact us. Uh, like I say, we do at least 19 a year. Um, okay. Could you give your email address? I can't see it. From I can barely see it here either. Um, um, T. Pillman at PCOA.org. Make sure you put the Y before the L. Otherwise, you end up with this really sort of grouchy guy that wants to know why you're emailing him. Um, so T. P. Y. L. M-A-N at PCOA.org. That's me. Um, okay, see, there you go. Now I'm in Prescott again. I, oh, oh, who is PCOA? Does anybody here know about PCOA? Okay. The Pima Council on Aging. First of all, let me say right away, we are not part of county government. We are, a, uh, yeah, it is. <laughs> we are a non-governmental, nonprofit organization. What we are is the Area Agency on Aging, or AAA. Now we're not gonna sell you a roadmap, and I can't help you with car insurance, but we do help people with growing older. And you know what I've discovered in the past few years, that if you're not growing older, you're dead. Yeah. So we're all growing <laughs> older, and we're here to help with that. The Area Agencies on Aging were chartered by the Older Americans Act, okay? And our job is to take resources, we get federal resources, state, county, local, donations, whatever we can get, and funnel those resources out to help people age better, to help people age safely and well. And that's what we do. Most of our programs are absolutely free. Uh, our classes, we have we ask for a little donation just to cover materials, but other than that, uh, one of the first ones I want to talk about, and truck over here. Oh, thank you. Uh, I have these brochures, and they're on the table out there, and I also have a lot, so grab one. They outline how to get a hold of us and what kind of services we, we offer. Uh, so, what do we offer? The first thing that I think will be of interest to you all is that we do really excellent caregiver support. If you are a caregiver, God bless you. If you have a caregiver, if you know a caregiver, we're there to help. We do seminars, we do workshops, we do individual sessions. We can help you arrange things like respite care and those kind of things. So if, if you need help with caregiving, let us know. We're there to help. 
we have a stellar Medicare section that will help you navigate Medicare. Okay, and I have talked to Medicare people that have saved people thousands of dollars by getting their Medicare straightened out. So if you're having any kind of trouble with Medicare, if you have any questions, I'm putting these down before I hurt myself, um, let us know, okay, because that's why we're there. We can help with Social Security. We have some legal services. We do a lot of advocacy. So if you need grab bars put in your apartment or you need lights put somewhere or a railing, give us a call. We will help. We do that. We have some veterinary services. We have some legal services. We'll even help with the taxes. We won't pay your taxes, but we'll help you fill them out. I know. You know, I work there. You think they can pay my taxes for me? Anyway, so, so we do that kind of stuff. We do classes like a matter of balance. We also have a, a chronic disease self-management class, which is really fine. We have a chronic pain management class, which while I haven't attended that one, it is, I am told, it is just absolutely excellent. I've talked to a lot of people that have gone to it. So there's that. We also have uh, managing your diabetes. Uh, which is really good. I've had people that were pre-diabetic go to that class, come out of it, and be no longer pre-diabetic. So, so we do things like that. We have exercise classes. We have all sorts of stuff. So give us a call. If it's an issue that has to do with aging, we deal with it. And if we don't deal with it directly, we know who does. Is it a business Sure is. Okay. Sure is. And also, I brought along our, um, well, no, I laid some right over there and I forgot about it. I brought our newsletter. This is the Never Too Late. Um, and um, it outlines a lot of what we do. It also has community calendars, all of our schedules, some really good information. So if you're curious, yeah, come on in. Um, we have these, and I left some out there, and I have some more, so, you know, please avail yourself. If you give PCOA $25, they'll mail this to your house. Go ahead. Yeah, excuse me. Um, I went out there, and there was bins. Which I knew Did I give you guys the Spanish ones? Yeah. <laughs> okay, well. Uh, but I don't know how to read Spanish. Uh, um, okay, I know some really good Spanish teachers. <laughs> um, I have some English here as well, so let me know. I didn't realize I picked up the Spanish one. Sorry. Um, um, anyway, okay, thank you for letting me know. Um, all right, here I am in Prescott again. I really like Prescott, and I think it's where my mind wanders there. Um, okay, so that's PCOA, and we really are there for you. Um, so I'm here to talk about falls. Now, some of the information I have is pretty general information for the general population. And if you have specific questions about how Parkinson's affects you in terms of falls, <laughs> please feel free to ask. If I don't know, I'll tell you. And maybe together we can figure it out. So. Um, some of the stuff is generally applicable, others is specific. Now, the first thing I want to talk about, I, I said that they did a lot of research into falls and what causes falls. Um, anybody here want to offer me a guess on what the leading cause of falls among older Americans is? Balance. balance. Well, balance, yes. Your balance goes bad, you fall down. Fear That's true. Falling. Fear of falling. Check out the big brain over here. That's exactly right. <laughs> no, it is. It is. Fear. Fear. What happens is that maybe we take a tumble. Maybe we know somebody who has fallen, okay, and hurt themselves. Maybe a loud mouth like me comes along and says, you know, of people over the age of 60 that break a hip, Half of them were dead within a year. 10% are dead within a month. 
That's kind of a scary statistic. It kind of frightens me. So that's a big deal. And so I have a, I don't know if you guys can see it. It's up here. What happens is that you get concerned. I have a spiral drawn up here. We call it the fall cycle. It's, see, it's what it looks like. Um, okay, so you get concerned, right? What I just said, if somebody falls, something like that. Well, this causes us to limit our activities. And if we're already, look at you, there she goes. Um, if, if you're already kind of limited in your activity options, this becomes even worse. There she is. So we become concerned. We start limiting our activities. We don't go out as much. We don't see our friends. We decide that, well, it's a little blustery outside. Maybe I won't go shopping, okay? Um, this can be very subtle. It can happen very slowly. The other thing that can happen is it can be very quick. I was talking to a lady and her sister was in great shape, went out to get the newspaper, fell off the porch, hurt herself, and now she won't leave her house. This is the kind of thing that happens. Folks give up. Well, wow, I'm gonna have you come to all my talks. Um, um, so we limit our activities. Well, this makes us get into worse shape. This is worse physical shape because we're not moving around. We aren't getting the exercise we used to do. Um, but it also gets us in worse mental shape. We aren't doing those things we used to do to get stimulus from, okay? We aren't talking to our friends. We aren't going out to play cards. We aren't going to the movies. We aren't going to church. Um, and it also gets us into worse emotional shape. Because again, we're not seeing friends and family. And we're worried all the time. So we get in worse shape. Uh, she also has better penmanship than I do. So. <laughs> But see, my second grade teacher hated me, so I can't write stick. But anyway, this often leads to isolation. We become isolated. We don't get out. We don't talk to people. And this leads to depression. Depression is huge, especially if you already have some other condition like Parkinson's. Depression can become crippling. We give up when we're depressed. We don't want to try. We don't believe that anything we do can make a difference. So this causes us all to become more concerned again. You should do a good job. Yay! Like I say, you're just gonna have to follow me around from now on. Um, okay. So this increases our concern, which then makes us limit our activities more. Our shape gets worse. We get more isolated. Our depression becomes deeper. And eventually, a fall becomes inevitable. This is like water going down a drain. And it all starts with fear. OK? Does this kind of make sense? Is it? OK. Um, so maybe the reason that I tripped and fell was that I caught my foot on a curb. Or, you know, we have these perfectly flat sidewalks here in Tucson. <laughs> okay, so maybe that's what caused me, but why wasn't I able to recover? Why didn't I see it in the first place? And that comes back to the fall cycle. And what does that, does that make sense to you? Okay, <clears throat> now there are two ways to deal with the fall cycle. Well, there are more than that, but the number one way, and this is true of almost everything in healthcare, the number one thing you can do for your health is stay active, okay? I see you chuckling over here, but um, it's actually true. Stay active. The more you move around, the better shape you're gonna get. Thank you. Um, the, the better you're going to do. Um, and you know, everything counts. I mean, coming here to the Power Gym 
and doing the exercises, this is a great place. And it does a lot, a lot, a lot of good. But you know what? Walking five extra steps does a lot of good. Um, getting up and moving around, as opposed to just sitting there and going, I really miss Bob Barker. You know, <laughs> it, it, get up and move around. Recently, they've started saying that sitting is the new smoking. Okay, what they have found is that people who smoke but are active do better than people who don't smoke and are not. I used to do concerts and special events. I worked with a lot of dancers, ballet and all that kind of stuff. I gotta tell you, 95% of them smoked. And they didn't just smoke every once in a while. You know, it was like, can I borrow your lighter? No, you already used it up. Um, okay, they smoked. They were all in better shape than I am. All right? Um, so you need to move around. Even if you can't get up and move a lot, even if you are constrained to a chair, moving your upper body, moving your feet, all of this will keep you more healthy. And it's amazing how little exercise can make a big difference. They recently did a study of, of people that hadn't been very uh, active, and they did a brain scan. And people who on their very first day of exercise, and this is older folks like us, on their very first day of exercise, they did a little bit of physical exercise, they did a brain scan, they found new neural interconnections in the amygdala, which meant that the memory was getting better. One day of exercise, okay? Um, they have found through study after study that exercise protects the brain from the effects of Alzheimer's, dementia, other neural problems. It doesn't make it invulnerable, but it actually really helps in dealing with it and recovering. Being active is the way to prevent a heart attack and to recover from it. When my father-in-law had quadruple bypass surgery, they had him up walking the hallways within 24 hours. He didn't walk far and he didn't walk fast, but they had him up. It's the way to, present, to, to prevent a, a stroke, to recover from one, to deal with almost anything that ails you, except maybe swine flu. Um, anyway. So, stay active, but also let's stay intellectually active. A crossword puzzle or a Sudoku is a fall prevention exercise because it turns those wheels, keeps them moving. Anything that stimulates us intellectually actually helps our balance. Stay emotionally active, stay connected. Having your friends over for a cup of coffee it's a fall prevention exercise. Stay active. The more active you are, the better. Also, okay, so now the number two way to move off this fall cycle is to take your time. I hear a lot, I've been doing this for 10 years, and I hear a lot of fall stories. And I don't mind hearing them. I mean, I always learn something from them. But I can tell you that 95% of those stories involve take your time. Let me give you an example. I had a lady who came to my class. Oh my God, I'm losing my anchor. I'm just gonna take it off, there. Um, now I don't know who I am. Um, she was boxing, she, she took my class and she did real well. And she came into my rec center and she had a big bruise. And I went, Judy, what'd you do? And she said, well, I was boxing stuff up. I needed to get another box, so I tried to jump over this one. <laughs> she never did get the stuff boxed up, okay? What she got was a big bruise, and if she'd taken one second to do that, <laughs> right? Okay, take your time. It's not a race. You don't have to be the first person to the top of the steps, and you sure don't want to be the first person to the bottom of the steps. <laughs> Okay, take your time. 
go slow. We all get impatient. We all have a million things going on in our lives that we're thinking about all the time. <clears throat> but you know, if you're out there walking around, you need to be thinking about walking around. Those people that, okay, they're waiting to fall. And, and, and if they don't fall, they're gonna knock somebody down. There used to be this game called Pokemon Go, and you took your phone to places and then you, oh, and I gotta catch this monster that's projected right there. I watched somebody walk into Reed Park Lake. <laughs> he didn't catch the monster even. <laughs> oh, people drive with it, right. Well, it turns out that distracted walking is just as dangerous as distracted driving. I talked to one lady, she was an avid bird, bird watcher. And she was walking along on her daily walk, and she heard a warble. And she goes, that must be the rare red-headed copper-breasted trogon. I have to see it. So she's walking along looking for this bird. What does she get to see? The common Arizona brown gopher <laughs> running for its hole because she landed next to it. If she'd taken her time and looked and then moved and looked and then moved, that gopher would be happier today. Okay, so take your time. Go slow. Now, I, I know that often folks with Parkinson's, that's kind of the only choice you have. But you can still rush even though you're going slow. You know what I mean? You can still be thinking about 12 other things. You can still be moving a little bit faster than you're physically capable of. You need to slow down. It's not a race. The other part of take your time. When I come into a room for the first time, I'll get out of the way of the door, and then I will spend three seconds looking around the room. And that way I see the extension cord or the, the mat that has a folded corner or the chair out of place. I see them, I can deal with them. So I take that time. Now, I had a lady who is a caregiver and she said, you know, I don't have time for that because my husband, I, I need to help him. I need to help him get through doors, I need to help him you know, all sorts of stuff. And I don't have time to just stop for three seconds. And my answer to that was, okay, so you don't. And you fall down, you hurt yourself, you end up in the hospital. Who's taking care of your husband? How much time have you really saved? None. So take that time. Take the time to call ahead. If you're going to go somewhere, the Desert Museum, Centennial Hall, wherever you want to go, take a minute out of your day and call them up and say, hey, I've got some mobility issues. Is there anything we can do? And you will be amazed at how far people are willing to go to help you come to their place. Okay? You'll find out, oh, there are ushers. We have a parking shuttle. You can do this or that. How many people here, when you go to the airport, get a wheelchair? Okay, a lot more hands need to be going up the next time I ask that. Because if you want to get through an airport, especially a busy airport, call up and say, you know, I could really use a wheelchair. And even if most of the time, you know, you've got a walker and you don't need a wheelchair, having a wheelchair in the airport really, really helps because you get to the head of all the lines. <laughs> it's true, you don't have to wait. You get on the airplane first. And you know, the people that push the wheelchairs around, they love doing it. You're actually doing them a favor because otherwise they have to count bags. <laughs> so, you know, do that. Take the time to do that because it really helps. When I go to the movies, or the theater, I get there early. I get there early because the lights are on. I get there early because I can get the seat I want, I, and I don't have to fight with the crowd. Now, I'm sure you've noticed in the movies, there's always a couple of people that are sitting there at the end of the movie watching the credits. That's my wife and I, okay? I don't know what the best boy is so good at, but I know his name. Well, what does that do for me? I don't have to fight the crowd to get out. The lights are on. I can get out at my own pace. 
And then when I get out to the parking lot, they've all already had their fender benders and I don't have to get involved. <laughs> so take your time. You're worth it. You deserve it. Take your time. And take the time to plan ahead. Take the time to go, well, I want to go shopping at, I don't know, pick one, fries. But the floors are kind of slick. And I kind of have trouble getting the groceries out of my car. So you think about this, and then you make a plan. You say, okay, so I, the floors are a little slippery. I'm going to make sure I take my assistant device. I'm, that is one fancy cane. Um, I am going to wear good shoes. Good shoes are really important. Those are really cute, and they're not really great shoes for not falling down. Okay, here is over there with the little flowers. My goodness, they're nice looking. And you know the fireman that comes to pick you up? He's not going to mention it. Okay, so pick, you know, wear good shoes. Take your assistive device. Um, make a plan. I'm going to ask someone to help me with the groceries. I'm going to hold on to the cart. Take the time to make a plan. Chance favors the prepared. If, if you've already made a plan, you're going to get through whatever happens better, and it's going to build confidence. And confidence defeats fear. Does this make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So that's take your time. But there's a lot more to this. Um, you know, we talk about good shoes. We talk about having your assistant device. Can I borrow your cane? Thank you, sir. I talk to a lot of people about falls, and I say, you know, you need to use your cane. And they'll tell me, well, you know, if I use my cane, I look so old. <laughs> okay, let me tell you, the gray hair and wrinkles, dead giveaway. <laughs> okay, it's not the cane. <laughs> uh, what this is, this is not a sign of weakness. This is a sign of intelligence. We are tool-using creatures. That's what separates us from the muskrat, is that we use tools. Okay? Um, and this is a tool for you to be able to do what you want to do. You wouldn't say somebody was weak or old or stupid if they were using a hammer to drive a nail. Right? You're using a cane to get where you want to go and do what you want to do safely. You're using a walker, a wheelchair, all of these things. These will keep you safe, and they are smart. Now, this is a pretty nice cane. I like these. And, you know, they, they sometimes stand on their own. Sometimes they don't. Um, and one of the things I like about canes like this is if they do fall down, you don't have to bend over to pick them up. You can just step on the toe, see? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You step on the toe, and then you miss it. <laughs> you step on the toe again. Now, if you're male, don't step directly in front of you. <laughs> You'll only do it once, but, but don't do it. Um, so these are a sign of intelligence. Those walkers are a sign of intelligence. Use them. Use them. There you go. Thank you, sir. Nice game. Um, Often, people don't need a cane all the time. But if you're out moving around and you get tired, then you need that cane. So I think yours is collapsible. Did I see that? Yeah. They're getting more and more of those, so you can carry that with you, and if you need it, it's snap. But also, we need to look at the situation we're in. I was talking to a gentleman, and he walked with a cane, but he did okay. And he said, but you know, whenever I go to Costco, I get one of those little scooters because I'm going to be there a long time. The floors are slick and hard. Excuse me. They are crowded. So I grab a cart. Now, normally, I don't like those things because often if someone has a medical condition and they get into one of those carts, they never get out again. But for this situation, I thought that was brilliant because he's keeping himself safe. He's keeping everybody around him safe. 
Well, right, but even then you can usually dodge. Um, you know, I was talking about, this reminds me, and you know, I'll tear, here I go off the press card again. Every year we have a centenarian celebration. We get, if you're gonna be over 100 by May, or even near 100 by May, let us know, we'll buy you lunch. We have a party, okay? And um, I think a year or so ago, we had 47 people over the age of 100. And they were not the entire population, they were just the ones that decided they wanted to come. Um, and they came from every background of life. It was as diverse a group as you can imagine. All religions, all races, all that. You know what they all had in common? They were all really, yes, they were old. Um, they, were, <laughs> they were all really active. The ones that were in the little scooters, boy, don't stop in front of them. You won't make 100. Um, we had one lady that was 103 years old, still works 40 hours a week. She runs Muscleman Honda. Oh, yeah. Right? I mean, oh my goodness. But they were all very active. Also, about half of them had a cocktail at night before they went to bed. <laughs> uh, worse for me. Um, anyway, um, so be active. It'll keep you alive. Um, but so use the tools you need to use in the situation you're in. And don't worry about what other people think. Because at some point, they're going to be there too. <laughs> so, you know, do that. Um, use your assistive devices. Think about what you're going to do. The other, one of the other really big fall prevention tips I can give you is learn to ask for help. This can be very hard, especially for men, I think. We were all raised on John Wayne movies. <laughs> and you know, the Duke didn't need no help getting up them steps, so neither should I. Well, baloney. Um, learn to ask for help. It will keep you more independent. If you know that you can get help, going up the steps to church, you're more likely to go to church. If you know you can get help from somebody going shopping, you're more likely to go shopping. You're more able to. <laughs> so while it may feel like if I gotta ask for help, I'm not as independent, <coughs> the truth is asking for help makes you more independent. Now we call this assertiveness, being assertive, asking for the help you need. But that could very quickly tip over to aggressiveness, can't it? Okay? It goes from being, oh, that nice lady that I occasionally help with her groceries to that mean old woman that always hollers at me in the parking lot. Um, we need to not be aggressive. We need to be assertive. Could you help me please? Please and thank you. Really important thing. Could you help me get through the door, please? Could you help me with my groceries? That kind of thing. And you know, people like to help. It makes them feel good. Think about the last time you helped somebody. It makes you feel good. We're hardwired to help one another. And so <coughs> asking for help, again, keeps you independent, keeps you safe, and really, there are times I let people help me even when I don't need it, just because I know it makes them feel good. So learn to ask for help and learn to stick up for yourself. If you have particular needs, there's nothing wrong with telling people about that. There's nothing wrong going into a restaurant and saying, I need a table I can fit my chair under. I need a place that I can put my walker. Um, that kind of thing. No, I won't hit you with my cane. You know, that sort of stuff. Um, so learn to ask for help because we all need it. We all need it. So learn that. Learn that. Um, what else can we do to keep ourselves safe? I talked about good shoes. You know, um, it turns out that the logical part of our brain 
develops last. It really does. In women, the prefrontal cortex gets completely developed by the time they're 19. In men, it's 22. <laughs> this is proof, sorry guys, that y'all are smarter than we are. If nothing else, you had more practice. Um, this is why teenagers make such really bad decisions, because the front of their brain isn't awake yet. Okay, so we need to do things that allow us to take our emotions and then reason with them. We get all this information from our senses and it goes to the back of our brain, the amygdala, the lizard brain. It's the first part of the brain to develop. I've already talked about the front of the brain. That's where reason is. So everything comes in and gets washed by our emotions. So we see a new situation and one of the first things we feel is fear. So we back off, right? Because back out there on the savanna, when the lion roared over there, we didn't stop and consider our options. We ran that way. Fear. So the idea is to move forward, is, is to get that stuff up. And one of the ways that we teach to do that is to sit down and think about specifically what you're afraid of. Not, I'm going to fall. That's too amorphous. That's too big. But why? What might make me fall? So if you're going to the theater, maybe it's the steps you're worried about. Maybe it's the slippery floor. Well, see, that we can deal with. We can come up with a plan for that. So what you do is you think, okay, I'd like to do this. What am I going to face? Is it worth doing? All right? What is the benefit you get from going shopping? What do you get? Anyone? I have this finger. I'm not afraid to use it. <laughs> Food. Food? Oh, Got to have that. You know, social stimulation. Social stimulation. Absolutely. You know, we're social animals. And even if you're not taking a big part of the group, sometimes it's just nice to be in a room full of people, isn't it? Right? Social stimulation. But another big thing we get from doing something like that is confidence. It's easier to talk yourself into it the second time. Confidence. Um, confidence defeats this. It defeats fear. But what do you gain from staying at home? What do you gain? Well, maybe a sense of security, right? You know, if you don't try and climb those steps, you're not going to fall down those steps. And what's the best way to keep from falling off a ladder? Don't, don't get on it. That's right. <laughs> um, so, but what do you gain? You gain sort of a sense of security. But what are you risking? You're risking lack of confidence. Not only are you not getting exercise and not getting stimulation and not being active, you're also tearing down your confidence. It's easier to talk yourself out of it the second time, isn't it? So we need to find ways to do what we can do. And you know, one of the things I tell people is do, oh, please. Yeah, I, I'm kind of rare. I've had Parkinson's since I was 39. Wow. I found myself in the contract when I had construction company. I found myself divorced by a living by living by myself until I put a resume together for a long time. And you know what I was quite sure I had an issue with my wife about the several years ago. Wow. And I was I know I was I was hoping to So what he's saying, if if you guys didn't hear it, <coughs> is that he got early onset of Parkinson's and he had problems with that ended up with a divorce and now he's put together a resume and is interning at a bicycle shop and it's become an important part of that man's business oh yeah it's an important part of the life too. and so you know that's a great story because it's don't give up keep trying um, but at the same time we also have to do to, to use judgment don't we I have a friend, and he loves to go hiking. 
He was in his 70s now. And he was up in Pima Canyon. And there's this trail that goes down one canyon and up another. Now, he's an experienced hiker. But he looked at that canyon, looked at his situation, and said, if I go down that canyon, the only way I'm coming out is in a helicopter. Okay? So he decided not to take that trail. He took another trail. If he has people with him, he might take that trail. The idea here is not to do things that you know are dangerous. The idea here is to use judgment, you know, and to really think about what the risk is and what you gain from it. So that's an important part of this, is learn to slow down and actually think about it. Okay, we all right so far? Any questions, any comments, please? Well, we had Vernon's questions previously about the person who is quite elderly, the old person, and um, doesn't necessarily have Parkinson's, but does have early dementia. Sure. And there isn't a lot of reason that does. It, it can forget, it, they can forget about, and short of having somebody tag on to them 24 seven, um, do you have any specific suggestions? That's a really that? difficult one. She's asking about people with, uh, that are older and that have early onset or have the beginnings of dementia <coughs> and what we can do to help them. Um, that's very difficult because a lot of this does involve problem solving. Um, what you can do is try to build constructive habits that they do automatically, okay? Also, um, a lot of us just find ways to, to either, if, if, if someone can't be with them all the time, find an environment that they're safe in and stimulate it. And a lot of places now are starting to do that. Um, the really bad thing about, of course, dementia is that often people don't know it. And also, it's really hard to make headway. Someone who is a caregiver for a dementia sufferer, God bless them, they have a hard, hard road to hoe. So, there you are. Um, thank you. I, mean, I, I wish I had more that I could tell you, but... Yes. And Good. Thank you. You remind and me. So I'm back Parkinson's on track. And so people, the very first time we went to see a neurologist, eight to ten years ago, the first question she asked my husband is, have you fallen? And at the time, the answer was no. Well, it's changed over time. Of course. Parkinson's people fall. Yes. And their blood pressure drops. Yes. So what do you suggest? Um, of course, always be in, in close communication with your physician, your neurologist, whomever you have, so that they can do this. But the other thing really helps with go slow. I mean, a lot of this keeps coming back to this. Anybody ever been sitting down, kind of relaxing, watching the tube, and decide you just have to get up? You stand up, and all of a sudden you're dizzy, whoa. In high school, we called it a head rush. I had a head rush, man. Uh, what's going on there is low blood pressure. For me, it's bending over, petting the dog or whatever, and then I stand up and, whoa, man. Okay. What's going on there is that you've gotten into this posture that it is easy for your heart to get blood to your brain. You stand up suddenly, and now it's harder, and there's a leg. Okay. And that causes the blood pressure in your brain to drop. And if you already have low blood pressure, this becomes really bad. And then you're not getting enough oxygen. You're not getting enough glucose. You get really dizzy. So if that happens to you, what should you do? Sit down. Sit down. Yeah, these aren't hard questions. Sit down. <laughs> Sit back down. And I often think to myself, you know, okay, so I'm in the aisle in the theater and I get up and I'm dizzy and I sit back down and now I'm slowing all these people down. Well, so what? Think about how much you will slow them down if you fall down in front of them, okay? And that's a big one also for a lot of things we do. I don't wanna be a bother. I don't wanna be a burden. 
but you know, you're trying to get up the steps and you need help and you don't want to bother that guy right there, so you don't. And you end up falling down the steps. How many people are you going to bother then? Okay. Um, one thing that I, I encourage everybody to do, especially if they spend any time alone, I'm starting to have another thought about the dementia, so give me a minute. And, uh, get an emergency notification device. You know, we've all seen the commercial, I've fallen and I can't get up. Yeah. And you know, when I was 20, that was kind of funny. It's not so humorous anymore. Um, those medic alert devices that they're talking about, do you wear them around your neck, do you wear them on your arm? Very simply, they save lives all the time, every day. Uh, 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 an older person in America falls and gets hurt every 56 seconds. Mm -hmm. You know, if I stand here and bounce around for a little bit, someone over there just went. <laughs> um, these emergency alert things really, really help. Now, the rap used to be that they only worked around your house. In fact, up until last year, you could get one free from the VA if you were a veteran, but they had a 600-yard range. It's great if you're around the house, and again, we're around our house most of the time. Nowadays, they have them that will work out here in the parking lot. They'll work all over. They have GPS. They even have them that will detect a fall. So if someone loses consciousness, faints, and falls, they'll call and they'll say, hey, you doing okay? These things save lives, especially for people who are alone. My wife and I are both pretty active. If I were older and had some other physical conditions, I'd have one of those, even though I don't live alone. But if you live alone, they're really important. The other thing we advise people to get are cell phones. Now I know, everybody goes, oh, I don't want a cell phone, it's a leash, and people I don't know will call me. Okay, you don't have to have service. You don't have to have Sprint or Verizon or Cricket. If you have a phone, even an old one, that is working, and you dial 911, it'll connect. Okay, that's a federal law. And you're allowed to test it. Just don't test it too often because they get kind of testy. But, so have a way to summon help. And again, having that builds confidence, right? Because there's someone that can pick you up. So that's important. Um, some of this seems like common sense. But I think it was Franklin who said, the least common flower in anyone's garden is common sense. <laughs> so it kind of takes some time to think about this sort of stuff. Um, this fear is built up of a lot of things, not only of getting hurt, but anybody here think falling down in public is, is, is kind of embarrassing? Sure, absolutely. What's the first thing we learn is uh, funny. A man slips on a banana peel, right? So that's part of the fear. If I fell down at church, I would be so embarrassed, so I'm not gonna go to church. Better you go to church. When was the last time you saw someone fall down and thought, well, that guy's stupid? I'm happy, you're worried about him. Eleanor Roosevelt, let me paraphrase her. The only person that can humiliate you is you. <laughs> it's the truth, okay? The, the embarrassing incident right now, six months from now, is something funny, we talk about it at the party. Get over that. Get over that shyness that, that keeps you from asking for help. Um, what else can we can we do here? Um, we can talk about ways of moving and getting up and down. If you're going up steps, okay, what foot, if you have a bad foot, often we do. If you have a bad leg or a bad foot, and I'm gonna go upstairs, what foot do I lead with? Your good foot, right. If you're going downstairs, what foot do you lead with? That one. Very good, that's right. Because you, your body is in motion. And so you want to support that motion with your strength. 
Um, the rule is up with the good, down with the bad, or the good go to heaven and the bad go to Tempe. Okay. So there you are. Um, but those little rules will really help us. It's the same thing getting in and out of a chair. Use your good leg to support the weight. Um, is there an empty chair I can grab? Kind of a demonstration. Well, if you don't mind, I'll give it back, I promise. Thank you. Getting in and out of a car. When you're getting in a car, how many people do that? Right, and then close the door? Yeah, and then we do this, right? Right? Okay, this slide. Really bad way to get in a car, especially if you have limited mobility. What you want to do is open the door, turn your back to the car, sit down, put your feet in. It doesn't matter which side, okay? And if you have to help someone get in a car, which I'm going to assume happens here a lot, this is the way to do it. Get them to turn their back, help them down, put their feet in. This is the way to do it. <coughs> Thank you. Um, little things like that. There's a device out now called a car cane. Anybody hear of that? Yeah. Yeah. You have one. Okay. Do you like it? Yeah. Okay. What it is, for those of you that don't know, it looks like a cane handle. Not as fancy as that one. It looks like a cane <laughs> handle, and it has a shank on it about that long. <coughs> And on your car, on the doorpost of your car, there's a little U that the door grabs. Well, you drop that shank in that little U, and now you've got a cane handle to hang on to getting in and out of your car. So, you know, you can't close the door first, you gotta take it off the other way. Um, I uh, am told that folks have seen them at Walmart for as low as 12 bucks. Uh, you can get them at Orleans for 30. But you know, that sounds like, well, okay, I'm on limited income. That could be a lot of money. Um, the average cost of a hip replacement in 2006 was $64,000. That's just the operation. That's just the guy with the mask and the knife and someone with the gas and a couple nurses. That's it. It's not the dollar a sheet of Kleenex. It's not the hospital stay. It's not the rehab. $64,000. 30 bucks, <laughs> okay? It's up to you, but I'm gonna spend the 30 bucks. How many people here have throw rugs? Nobody, good, wait, well, you do, bad. Um, no, I'm teasing. Um, throw rugs, we call them throw rugs because they will throw you on the ground and you should throw them away. Now, some people, they have this throw rug that their grandmother brought back from Afghanistan. Put it on the wall. You don't need it on the ground, okay? How many people here have grab bars? Well, you know, everybody's hand ought to be coming up here. Um, grab bars save lives. That's, it's that simple, okay? Call PCOA. We have all sorts of services we can refer you to to get grab bars installed. If your landlord, should you have one, not want to put a grab bar in, give us a call. We will convince him. <laughs> okay? Um, so, grab bars. I've had, I've had one of them since we grew up. And I call it a mitigated fall. It kind of slides out halfway and you can kind of right. flop under the Right, mitigated fall. And that's, that's better than an out-and-out -out fall. You know, I encourage people to stay near walls because you can grab some. Okay, you can slide down. It is better to slide down and sit than to smack on the ground. People ask me, is there a safe way to fall? Nope, there's not. Uh, I took a martial art for years called Aikido. It's a lot like judo. You get thrown, so you have to learn to fall. They spent two months teaching me to fall to the point that it became muscle memory. Because you fall so fast that you don't have time to run a checklist. Oh, that guy Tom from PCOA, he said, um, you don't have time for a checklist. 
So everything has got to be muscle memory. There is no safe way to fall. But what we do tell you to do is this. Okay, because we've been doing this since we were kids. So it's muscle memory. You have a question? Okay. It's this. We call it defensive extension. And yes, you might break your wrist. It's probably the most common fall fracture. But you know, I've got two wrists. I've only got one skull. And there's, you know, not that much in there anyway. But still, okay, put your hands up. Put your hands down. So I can't teach you how to fall, but I can help you prevent them. Mostly it's by going slow. It's by slowing down. Okay, so we're running up here till about to, to 5.30 now. Um, and I was told that, that right around, no, 5 o'clock, I'm sorry. The whole telling time thing. Um, it's, it's about 5 o'clock, and I was told that I should leave about half an hour for questions, answers, discussions. Any questions, answers, or discussions? Something you brought up earlier about the, the bars um, is speaking out. Um, we spoke up at church, uh -huh. and there was at bars in every one of the bathrooms. That we Outstanding. Had. Good job. We have to protect ourselves. We have to protect one another. <coughs> if there were something here, and if there's not, this is a remarkably safe space. Um, but if there was something here that was obviously hazardous, would you be willing to point it out? Yeah, because you're not only keeping yourself safe, you're keeping other people safe. His getting the bars in the church not only helped you, but it helps everybody that comes to that church that needs it. So we need to advocate for each other and to help each other. Any other questions? Um, I can keep babbling, so you know it's okay. Go ahead. Um, well, this isn't a question, but back to the lower blood pressure, something that we yes. found was really helpful is before standing up to um, wiggle your legs. And Thank you. I knew I was forgetting something. Can I have your chair again? Sure. Okay. I talked a little bit about the blood pressure thing. That's actually called orthostatic hypotension. This is a great word for a cocktail party, because you see someone get up real fast and you go, you have orthostatic hypotension. And everybody goes, wow, that person's really smart. <laughs> we all get it, it's low blood pressure from a static posture. But what she's talking about, and this is very true, if you're sitting in a chair, it's time to get up. You know it is, the meal's about over or whatever. You had enough of your brother-in-law and it's time to go? Okay. Rotate your feet around. Pick your feet up and rotate your ankles. Just do that. This is the most important exercise we teach. Because your ankles are where balance starts. You know, it's what tells you the ground is bad, and it's what helps you do it. So move your legs a little. Take a breath. Put your nose over your toes. Get a little momentum. Sometimes I rock or I reach out. I stand up and exhale. You exhale on exertion, right? Okay, then I take a breath and I count to three. One, two, three. Uno, dos, tres. I do that because it gives me time, if I'm going to get dizzy, to notice it. And we've already said, if you're dizzy, sit down, right? So thank you. That's exactly what you want to do. You want to move your feet. You want to let your body know you're going to get up. You want to get things flowing. One of the things, one of the best things you can do for someone with dementia, now that I've let it circle around, get them to be physically active. The more physically active you can, oh, I'm sorry, I took your chair away and didn't give it back. <laughs> Oops. Um, thank you. Like I said, she is going to have to start following me around. That's just all there is. Um, what they have found is that the effects of physical activity not only help prevent dementia, they also, it also helps to treat it, to deal with it. Here's another really important one. I said talk to your doctor. Talk to your doctor. Did I say that? Talk to your doctor? Okay. Um, falls are a symptom as much as they are a result. Those of you that have Parkinson's kind of know that you started falling a lot more 
right? Your balance got worse. Mm -hmm. It's a symptom. They did um, a study where they did autopsies on people with, uh, that were diagnosed with um, Alzheimer's, okay? And they found that in fully 50% of the cases, people didn't have Alzheimer's. What they had was an array of small brain injuries that presented like Alzheimer's, okay? But those are treated much more successfully and differently than you would treat Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia. So you need to talk to your doctor, especially if when you have fallen, you don't know why you fell. You know, you're standing there and bam! Um, you got hurt if you fell. You lost consciousness if you fell. If you're falling a lot, you need to tell your doctor. And you need to not be afraid to call the paramedics. If I fall and I hurt myself, I'm calling Tucson Fire. Okay, I'm calling 911 because, again, this is a symptom. I have a cat, and his favorite game is Trip Tom. Okay, um, so you know, I trip over the cat. I'm okay. I get back up. I'm not going to call my doctor. But the next time I see my doctor, I'm gonna mention, you know, the cat got me. And then he'll tell me something about pistols and give me a running start. Um, but, but still, I'm gonna tell my doctor. Your doctor is very important because of Parkinson's laws. Many of us are multiple DBS and we take drugs as well. Sure. If you have, you've got chemo treatment for you, you've got, you've got you know, that's a tip of how you're feeling. Um, at a certain amount of time, I mean, when you can do cardiovascular measures, you treat your gut, but you know, you're getting, you get better. What he's saying is that it is so important. I hear some of the things online support that To talk to your doctor. It is so important. Because, uh, but there's another person you should talk to. Anybody want to guess? Your spouse, yes. You should definitely tell your family that you're having problems because they can't help what they can't, but what they know about. Though I did have one woman who called her daughter in Oregon, and she said, you know, my balance has gotten kind of bad, and I fell down. And her daughter's reply was, well, you know, Oregon is a right-to-die state. <laughs> I would have got, I'm changing the will. Um, anyway, yes, you should absolutely tell your family. The other person you should talk to is your pharmacist. Seriously. I, I am in pretty good shape, and I have four doctors. I can't imagine how many doctors you folks see. I mean, there's got to be a lot. And they try and coordinate their, their care, but often they miss. Talk to your pharmacist. Take your list of medications, your over-the-counter medications, your supplements. Take them to your pharmacist and ask, what's this doing to me? Is this going to make my, my chance of falling greater? And you don't even have to be a customer at the pharmacy, and they'll talk to you about it. Doctors get one year of pharmacological treat, uh, uh, training. Pharmacists get three focused on pharmacy. So talk to your pharmacist about what your conditions are. Talk to your physical therapist. Because I'm willing to bet this is a good group of physical therapists, but none of them can read minds. Well, they might be able to read mine because the words are really short and the letters are real big. But otherwise, you know, so you've got to tell them. They're happy to help you, but if they don't know you're having pain in this leg, they can't do anything about it until you tell them. You have to communicate, and that's a big thing. That's a big thing. So basically, you go slow. You stay active. You think about this. Am I not doing things because I'm afraid? You know, to me, rollerblading looks like a lot of fun. It also looks like a broken hip. So I'm not going to rollerblade. It's that kind of thing. Um, 
is there anything that you're curious about that I haven't talked about or you'd like me to talk about more? I want to make sure I'm not running over all day. You're good? Okay. Um, um, often people are reluctant to call for help, to call the fire department. Don't be. Don't be. You're paying them. They want to come to your house and help you. All they're doing is either washing their fire truck or sitting around watching reruns of emergency. <laughs> so, you know, don't be afraid to call them. Don't be ashamed to call them. I've talked to people that say, oh, my husband, he's not breathing, but don't run the lights and siren. <laughs> Come on, the lights and siren is the most fun part of this. <laughs> Give us a break. And plus, they're going to run the lights and siren anyway. Yeah. Um, don't be afraid to ask for help. Don't be afraid to look for help. Don't be shy. Because all that is is, is a way to fall. Um, here's one. Oh, go ahead, please. Something else that is very helpful is most people here are on Medicare. Sure. And they have, uh, you have supplemental insurance. And most of those insurance companies would love to send people out to your home. They sure do. Thank and you. they will evaluate your home for those trip dangers and the areas that are hazardous that you, you may take for granted, mm -hmm. but by removing or adjusting things, it makes it safer. Um, and, and in fact, um, Tucson Fire doesn't do it because there's just too many people in the valley, but if you live up in the Golder Ranch Fire District up in Oro Valley, or down in Green Valley, or out in Drexel Heights, you can call the fire department, and they'll come, okay? Um, because having your house surveyed and looked at, you'll be amazed how much people find. And they're not gonna say, golly, what is that in your refrigerator? <laughs> okay, which can make you fall down. <laughs> Um, but, you know, they will say, well, you need to move those cords, you need to do this, and, and, it, and that's really good. Um, so there's that. Here's another tip for you, and I'm kind of saving this for last, but I think you'll find it useful. When you're up and moving about, find a vertical target. That is the edge of that wall, the door frame. Okay, we have three systems of balance in our bodies. Our inner ears, right? Mm -hmm. What we call proprioception, those folks back there know what that is, but what it is is body sense. All of your joints have nerve endings, and they tell you how your nerve endings, have, where your arm is and where your leg is and all that. And the other one is our eyes. And you know, we can all tell if a painting is even just a little bit off, right, on the wall, it drives you nuts. Okay, so if you're looking at that corner or you're looking at that door frame and that door frame in your visual field is tipped, it's not the door frame, it's you. Um, okay, um, if that door frame is moving back and forth, it's not the door frame, <laughs> it's you. So, you know, earthquake, earthquake yeah. Um, um, outside, you can look at the corner of buildings, you can look at sign poles, telephone poles, find a vertical target and keep referring to it. Don't just stare at it while you walk because then the cat's gonna get you, okay? You move your eyes, you scan, you look around and then you come back to the vertical target. And you will be amazed at how much more steady you are by just doing that, okay? Um, it seems really simple, but the fact is it works like a charm. And everybody I know that has tried to use that come away with, oh yeah, that's just great. So that's a really important tip for you to take if you don't take anything else what out of it. What if you're blind? What if you're blind? Then have someone else do it and hang on to it. <laughs> um, you know, there's always going to be a condition or a situation where all this stuff doesn't work. And that's when you really need to stop, think about it, and come up with a different solution. You know, uh, I am constantly amazed at people who are blind, who move around and stumble less than I do. I keep wanting to run up and go, how do you do that? But it happens. So sometimes you really need to, to stop and, and really think about it. But other times, something as simple as that is really very useful. 
Yes. You can call the um, 911 and they will come and pick you up. And uh, No, it's true. And what she's saying, and it's another category of really serious falls, is I've fallen and I can't get up. And I can tell you, having been a fireman, that they would rather come out 10 times and pick you up and dust you off than miss that one time. Okay. And like I say, this is why you're paying them. This is why you're paying those taxes. Call them. And if you can't get up, call them. The other thing about falling is if I've fallen and, and I can't get up, my goal is not to get up. My goal is to get help. That's right, help. I don't know how badly hurt I am. I don't know what kind of injuries I've got. So I, if I fall, I'm going to lay there. I'm going to do a self-survey. I'm going to wiggle my toes, all that. And then I'm going to try to get to some place to summon help. If I've got a medic alert thing, I'm going to hit that and go, send me cute firemen. <laughs> and they will. OK? If I have a cell phone, I'm going to go 911. If you could send me that new female paramedic, I'd really like it, okay? They probably won't. Okay? But your, your goal is to get help. So if my cell phone is over there on top of the water thing and I fall down here, well, it might take me all day to crawl over there. But better than laying here and dying. Someone was saying they knew someone who laid for 17 hours. I have heard of cases, I, there was one woman who had MS, and she had a seizure, she hit the ground, couldn't move, laid there for four days. And the only reason she survived was a neighbor said, well, I haven't seen Judy in a while. Went over, looked through the window, and there's Judy. Now, Judy wasn't hurt by the fall. She, you know, a little bruise, but she couldn't move. So they got the paramedics there, they got Judy to the hospital, and then that same person had to go the next day and say, Judy, your house has been hit by lightning and it burned down. <laughs> Talk about a bad week. <laughs> Woo! Makes my week seem bad. At least she wasn't in it. Right. Um, so your goal, if you hit the ground, is to get help. Not to get up. To get help. Go ahead. Good. He unlocks the front door. Excellent. Excellent. Now, no, and that's a good idea. Yeah. However, I often get the question, how does the fire department get in? Do I have to crawl to the door? No. No. The only thing that a fireman enjoys more than running with the lights and sirens is knocking down a door. Okay, well, we get special tools. We run up, and then someone would go, it's unlocked, and we go, darn it. Um, <laughs> Um, but that's expensive. And now local fire departments, including TFD, have what's called a lockbox program. And what it is, is, is you get this box. It's a metal box, a complete box, that's installed on your door frame. The fire department has the key. Nobody else has the key, not the police department, not even you, has the key. They come, they unlock it, there are your door keys, they, they go through the door. But there is no door in this valley that a fire department can't get through. That includes bank vaults. You're there in the bank, you fall down, the door slams shut, they can still get to you. But it'll take them a while. Okay, go ahead. Something you, you kind of, I mean? No, I will, both of you. I'll, I'll be right there with you, we're gonna let you. I wanted to, go ahead. I was gonna be here for a week, but um, Thank you. the issue of counseling, Yes. You know, it says that it always strikes me that it's kind of like a miracle because whenever I've been away from walking, I have Parkinson's, and the first walk is always hard and it takes a lot of courage. But then after one week of successful walking, I don't even think about being nervous. And that, that, that's really amazing to me that it just happens without me changing. 
Yeah, um, it is really nice. Huh? This lady's amazing. Why does she look amazing? Just the shirt alone. <laughs> what were you going to say? Oh, uh, what she's kind of skirted around earlier about brain damage. Um, and what a lot of people don't understand when the table falls is the brain moves around in the head. Sure does. And it can, can cause damage, brain damage. And if you try to get up, sometimes, it, you know, when you start, you feel like dizziness, it's not low blood pressure, but damage is done to your brain. Right. And it's another reason you need to get help. Yes, she's absolutely right. What she's saying is that often we mistake uh, other neurological symptoms for things like bad blood pressure or, or that. Your brain floats around inside your skull. It's not attached. And so when you fall, even if you don't hit your head, your brain gets smacked into the back of your skull. They call that a contra coup injury. Bye! Be careful! Um, that's called a contra coup injury. And that's why you need to report falls to your doctor. She was talking about how your first time you come back from being laid up and it's really hard to, to get walking again, but then after a while it becomes easy. This is very true. Confidence defeats fear, and once you've managed to do this, it becomes easier to do it. Another thing that folks with Parkinson's talk to me about is the freeze. Mm -hmm. That you're starting to walk, and you're starting to do something, and you, you, you just can't, right? And you've got to find a way to break the freeze. And often they'll say, do things like count your steps because that'll help. That vertical target will also help with the freeze, okay? Because you're frozen here, then you think to yourself, okay, I'm, I'm gonna find that vertical target, and finding that will help break the freeze. So that's something you can do there. Um, good shoes, um, reacher grabbers, I mean, there's lots of tools. And I really encourage everyone to come take my class, and I'm gonna stop talking here because everyone's leaving. <laughs> so there we go. Had his hand up here. Oh, you had your hand up. What's up? Is it a good idea when you're standing to try to keep your feet apart a little bit? Yes. Yes. Taking a good stance can be very important because if you're here like this, you don't have much of a base. If you're here, you do. The other thing is when you're sitting or starting to stand, put your good leg back. It's called a staggered stance. And then you can put your weight on the good leg. So that's, there you go. Um, okay, well, uh, if anybody has any more questions, please ask them. I'll hang out for a while. I have more night lights and little brochures. Thank you all so much. You all really are.